Hello students, this is Dr. David, and this uh, module commentary goes along with chapters 2 and 3 of your lab manual. And please bear with me as, um, first of all, my dog is whining in the background, and second of all, um, I'm going to try to pack a lot of information into this 15-minute video. So um, some of it is still confusing to you. That's totally normal. I'm also going to include some links to some different videos that you can watch, um, different animations that will help to explain what we're talking about in this video. I will include those links in the discussion forum. So um, let's start out with the karyotype. Okay, so here is the karyotype of a human female. And um, as you can see with humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And uh, so this is what the human karyotype looks like. And if you were to, you know, take a picture of the chromosomes that are in a human cell, this is what it would appear as. And so what are these chromosomes all made of? Well, chromosomes are made of, just as a recap from Anthro 101, these chromosomes are made of tightly, tightly coiled strands of DNA. And if you were to take all the DNA that's coiled up into that chromosome and stretch it out, it would like stretch to the moon, you know, just in one human chromosome. There's so much DNA that is all just bundled up, just bunched up there instead of one of those chromosomes. And so just to give you that illustration of DNA, um, here are some different pictures of it. And here's a nice one, just like a blow-up view, that you have going down the side of the DNA strand. You have alternating pairs of sugar and phosphate. You don't see that here, but that is what is um, making up that side of the ladder. It's alternating pairs of sugar and phosphate. Sugar and phosphate. And the middle of it, going across, you have alternations of um, adenine and thymine. Adenine and thymine always bond together, or cytosine and guanine. They always bond together. And, um, and so the exact sequence that you get those alternations in, whether you get, you know, adenine and thymine here, or cytosine and guanine, another cytosine and guanine, you know, that simple switching up of that formula in the rungs of the ladder um, is literally what creates our entire genetic code. So it sort of boggles the mind to think about it, you know, that the entire human genetic code is written with simply with these four molecules here. And if you know about computer science, computer science is actually not that different. Computer code is also written in just ones and zeros. And think about, you know, we have an iPhone that's based in that. So it's pretty amazing to think about. And yeah, you can write code that is really simple that can just give you like infinite variation and infinite creativity to come out of it. So um, in these chromosomes here, we have each pair of chromosomes codes for different traits. And to give you an example of one particular trait um, that we can talk about is a trait that I always you know, think of as a good example. It relates to this singer. I like him a lot, Troy Swan. He's Australian. And um, he does have a mild case of something called Marfan syndrome. And Marfan syndrome is a gen genetic trait, so we're going to talk about it a little bit just to give you an illustration of how genetic traits work. So he does have a mild case of Marfan syndrome, and Marfan syndrome um, basically just makes you very tall and lanky. You get like very long arms and long limbs. You're very thin, and you know, luckily for Troy Sivan, that is sort of what's in fashion in modern days culture. Um, so that's Marfan syndrome for you. Now, Marfan syndrome, let's look at it in terms of the actual DNA, okay? So I looked it up, and Marfan syndrome occurs on the pair 15. So if we were to go back to the karyotype here, pair 15, that is where the Marfan syndrome occurs. That is where the gene for Marfan syndrome occurs. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, it will show you like exactly where on that chromosome the Marfan syndrome is located. Um, and let me just look it up. Okay, yeah, Marfan syndrome is on that chromosome and I don't know if it's going to show us exactly where on the chromosome the Marfan syndrome is um, located but basically what's going on here in these chromosomes is they're not coding for a specific trait necessarily they're all just coding for different proteins and whether you have a protein or not 
that is what causes you to have Marfan syndrome or not have Marfan syndrome or to have blue eyes or to have brown eyes. It's all about the proteins that are being produced off of these chromosomes. That is what causes us to have our different um, genetic traits. So Marfan syndrome is located on human chromosome 15. And, um, and so basically, the entire uh, human genome, all of our genes, we, it has been sequenced. And that sequencing was part of a huge uh, project that took like 20 years. It's called the Human Genome Project. And with that project, they basically figured out on human chromosomes, oops, back to this on human chromosomes they figured out that where every last trait is located on our human chromosomes so um so that's uh, a little bit about you know genetic traits and like and how they are um, coded on our dna now we're going to come back to that in a minute we're going to come back to try savan's example of the marfan syndrome in a minute um, when we do our punnett squares but something else that your lab chapters talk about is um, how are these proteins actually being produced from the dna and at first it can look very confusing very intimidating but it doesn't have to be it's actually a simple process it starts with the dna strand basically unlocking and mRNA coming along and matching up with it. And the mRNA is messenger RNA, and it's sort of the in-between um, between the DNA and the process of the production of the protein. The mRNA is sort of like the middleman. And so the DNA strand unlocks itself, and mRNA forms along one side of the strand of the DNA. And um, if you look close on this, you will see that you have CG, so cytosine guanine, on the, you know, coming up on the mRNA strand. But instead of thymine bonding with adenine from the mRNA strand, there's a molecule called uracil. Uracil is what you find on the mRNA strand that sort of substitutes for the thymine and locks in with the adenine. So. Um, from this DNA strand here, we've formed a length of mRNA with um, alternating sequences of the uh, different molecules, the cytosine, the uracil, the adenine, the guanine, and that pattern was formed to match up, to lock up with the DNA. And so mRNA then goes through another process where here's our mRNA from before, and now we have something called tRNA, translation RNA, which is now going to hook up with the mRNA. So tRNA is now going to hook up with the mRNA, and you've got, you know, C and G are going to pair up, and uracil and adenine, and cytosine and guanine. The tRNA, what it is doing, though, it is carrying along with it all of these um, molecules that are the building blocks of the protein. So if you take protein supplements, you might notice that it lists like the particular amino acids that are inside of your protein. And, um, and that's what these are. These are different amino acids that are being pulled along by the tRNA um, on, to match up with the mRNA. And then these amino acids, they then lock together. And then what you form from those locked together amino acids that have all lined up with each other you get your protein. And now that's how the protein has been created from um, the process of DNA forming mRNA and then mRNA getting hooked up with these tRNAs, which carry along with them different amino acids. And those chains of amino acids are what proteins are made of. That's what proteins are made of. Okay. So let's circle back now to talking about the Punnett square. So um, Marfan syndrome um, is autosomal dominant, and what that means is that all it takes is one dominant gene for Marfan syndrome, and you will have it, which means if you don't have Marfan syndrome, that means that you have on your chromosomes here, remember we had said it was pair 15, so if you don't have it, that means that in the location where the Marfan syndrome is, if you don't have it, you have a recessive and a recessive. Um, and if you do have it, that means you have a dominant and a dominant or dominant and recessive. Now, why are 
genes called dominant or recessive, it simply comes down to does this dominant, does this gene override the other gene? If it does override the other gene, then that gene is called dominant. If this gene gets over road or whatever the word is overridden by that gene then now this is a recessive so just recessive means that its code gets overridden or overridden whatever the verb is its code will be ignored by the body if there is another code there that is the dominant code that's what the difference is between dominant and recessive doesn't mean that like one is better than the other, doesn't mean that one is more common than the other, because as we can see with Therese Vaughan and Marfan syndrome, Marfan syndrome is caused by having a dominant allele. So if you don't have Marfan syndrome, I can tell you right now on your pair number 15, you have a recessive for it, and you have a recessive for it. Okay, that's how it works. But with Troy Savon, we know that on his pair number 15, he either has a dominant and a recessive or dominant and dominant. Okay, so now that's going to take us into the last piece of the puzzle, which is the Punnett square. Okay, so say Troy Savon is going to have a kid. Um, you know, we know, we can, we can say that his um, genotype is dominant and recessive. Let's just say it's dominant and recessive um, for the sake of this argument. It, as I said, it could also be dominant and dominant, but let's say it's dominant and recessive. So we're going to take his genotype for the Marfan syndrome, and we're going to see whether his kid would get it too. So we're going to take his genotype, we're going to split it up, and we're just using capital letter N to indicate dominant, lowercase n to indicate um, recessive, and, uh, and never mind neurofibromatosis, we're just using this for talking about Marfan syndrome. We're going to take his two alleles and put them on the side of the Punnett square here where you have, we put the big N there, the little N there, and that's what geneticists call it. They call it big N, little N. So we're going to put big N there, little N there. Okay, and let's say that his partner, who he has a child with, that their genotype is little N, little N, which means that they have two recessive alleles. So we put one of the alleles here, and one of the alleles there, and note I'm using allele interchangeably with gene, you know, they're sort of the same term, so we take their two alleles and put it there, and now we're just going to predict the chances of, you know, if this um, allele were to meet up that allele, what would the kid get? And if that allele met with that allele, and this is all being sorted out in reality through the process of reproduction where you have the gamete meeting the egg. That's like physically what's happening, but we are taking it and diagramming it in a box. So anyway, okay, so um, you just connect the dots. So his big N, um, you know, meets up with his partner's little N, and so, you know, big N, little N. So if this child got made, yes, they would have Marfan syndrome. If his little N meets up with his partner's little N, then the child would have little N, little N, which means they do not have Marfan syndrome. Okay, if his big N meets up with his partner's little N, then once again, child, yes, they do have Marfan syndrome, big N, little N. And if his little N meets up with his partner's little N, then the child has little N, little N, which means they do not have Marfan syndrome. So once again, we call the call the uh, excuse me dominant gene. We represent it with a capital letter, and you can use any letter you want. Just make sure that it uppercase and lowercase look different, so you don't get it confused. And we do in genetics, we do refer to it as big N, little N. I know that sounds like you know kindergarten or something, but that's how geneticists refer to it, whether in capital N or lowercase N, they call it big N or little N. So, um, so there you have it. And what are the chances that their kid would come down with the Marfan syndrome? Well, it's one, two out of one, two, three, four possibilities. So two out of four is 50%. And so that's uh, the chances that their kid would come down with the Marfan syndrome. Okay, so I packed a lot of information into this short 15 minute video. And if you still have questions, if there's still stuff you're not sure about, that's okay. I will include links with different animations in the discussion form and you can take a look um, at those as well. Alrighty, everybody, I'll see you in the next video.